Now we're gonna do our mining panel. So I would like to invite the, uh, the panelists. Um, Amanda Fabiano from the Fidelity. Uh, Brad Kopman from the CMT Digital. Jess Peltman uh, from Hodo, uh, Hodo Ranch. And our, um, which is gonna be moderated by Cassie Clifton from BTC Media. Please welcome our participants. All right, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Cassie Clifton. I work for a company called BTC Media and Operations. Um, we own Bitcoin Magazine. I'm the host of the uh, What's Happening podcast. I'm gonna be moderating this panel today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let everyone briefly introduce themselves and then we'll dive on in. Uh, Brad, do you wanna get started? Sure. My name is Brad Copen. I'm from CMT Digital. CMT Digital is a 23-year-old proprietary trading firm. We've been running a uh, cryptocurrency trading desk for over three years, and we have a venture capital arm that invests in blockchain operating companies. Amanda? Or Jesse? Hey guys, uh, my, name, my name is Amanda Fabiano. I work at Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. I'm the director of Bitcoin Mining there. Jesse? Hey, uh, Jesse Peltam, I'm CTO of Hoddle Ranch, and we're focused on uh, data center development in West Texas. All right, so um, everyone that's on this panel has really, really different expertise. So um, kind of wanted to start off with some questions that are a little bit more, um, that help you get to know each of them and, and what their areas of expertise are just a little bit better um, and kind of how all of that ties into Bitcoin mining. So um, the first question that I want to ask is, what does success look like uh, for each of your companies in relation to Bitcoin mining? Um, and I'll let Amanda start with that one. Ooh, you're, you're starting strong, Cass. Um, so I guess I can start with a little bit of background of what we've been doing in mining to kind of share what some of the success has been so far and then what we plan to do in the future. So uh, Fidelity, we started Bitcoin mining really early. Um, we started in about 2013, 2014 through our Fidelity Center for Applied Technology, the group that I work for. And um, this group has a specific uh, incubator focusing on Bitcoin and blockchain technology. And so early on, they said, hey, we should probably figure out what mining is. So they plugged in some machines in one of our little offices, um, and we had a really small operation, and we were able to learn quite a bit from that and also make a little bit of money, which was nice. Um, but, you know, from there, we learned things like, hey, how do you custody this asset, right? Hey, um, you know, all, like, how do you buy machines? How do you plug them in? All of those great things. So a lot of what we know is operational um, and Obviously, we, you know, we let that sit there. And as you guys all know, um, machines, they don't last forever, sadly. So in 2018, we saw about a 30% failure rate on those machines. And we said, let's figure out what else is going on in the market, in the Bitcoin market um, for mining. So we revamped our operation. We ordered from all the different manufacturers. Um, and we also looked at co-location facilities, both internally at Fidelity and externally. Um, and, you know, we, we explored there for a little bit, and that was over the past two years. Um, and now we're trying to look at, you know, um, what does a larger, uh, I don't know, like what else could we be, be doing? Like are there like financial products like Brad is building that are interesting to us? Um, it's still all in the research phase, which is nice. So I guess, you know, success to us is really understanding the ecosystem um, and also understanding it from an operational perspective, how mining works. Yeah, I bet it's super fun getting your hands dirty with all of those cords and, and setting them up for the first time. I know that can be uh, oh, a hassle. Yeah. <laughs> it is, um, it's fun. <laughs> uh, Brad, do you want to take this one? Sure. So um, thinking about mining is sort of is something new for us where we've come at the uh, Bitcoin and crypto space from a, a trading perspective. Um, so over the last few months, we've been working with uh, our portfolio companies and a few um, sort of outside partners to start thinking about how to solve some problems in the sort of derivative space for mining. Where as mining has grown as an ecosystem and as it's matured, you start to realize that uh, they have a lot of risk in running these operations. Can we um, design some financial securities that can help them manage that risk? Uh, so right now, uh, as Amanda said, it's, it's very much in the research phase. We are working with a few uh, partners internally and externally to try to figure out how do we price 
a difficulty future? How do we think about um, a transaction fee derivative? Uh, how do we, you know, just talk to enough miners to get a little bit of consensus in terms of, uh, you know, what their risks are, how do they hedge those risks, and then how do we sort of, from our end, price that risk such that we're not taking all that risk and we're trying to find and stand up a market where there might be some participants on both sides to allow participants in the industry to, uh, to reduce their risk and run a, a more efficient business by, uh, you know, trading some of this risk off to other people, either on the financial derivative or other people in the industry that might want that risk. Jesse? Uh, for us, success looks like more hash rate indexes. Woo, yeah, <laughs> short and sweet, I love it. Um, so I am, the next question I'm gonna pose, uh, posing this in particular because of one of the panels um, that I heard yesterday, uh, talking about what a waste of energy the process of mining Bitcoin is. Um, so this is for all of you, um, would love for you maybe to touch on this, one, this uh, particular idea that mining Bitcoin is a waste of energy, but also any other misconceptions. Um, so what do you guys believe is the largest misconception about Bitcoin mining? Jesse, you wanna take that one? Sure, yeah, I'll take that one. So um, I, think, I think that part of the misconception here comes from, um, from ideas of how we think about energy consumption. So uh, energy consumption isn't inherently a bad thing. It depends on where that energy is coming from and how that's being used uh, that determines whether that is a waste or not. Um, the incentive structure of Bitcoin makes it so where you have to have, at this point in the game, very low cost energy in order to stay competitive. And that's typically in areas where you have energy that's underutilized. Um, and something that's really interesting about Bitcoin mining that's underappreciated in terms of, uh, of energy and in the energy market is that Bitcoin mining doesn't require the same sort of uptimes that other sorts of uses do. So it's not a critical load on the grid and therefore it can be served by sources of energy that don't have that um, utmost reliability. So you can actually use Bitcoin mining as a part of grids um, that enable them to have a higher percentage of renewables than they could otherwise. Kind of expounding upon that idea, why then would you say that, um, you mentioned renewables, but like how, what does the data show in terms of like uh, Bitcoin mines are using renewables geographically speaking, if you can just kind of expound upon that idea a little bit um, to clarify. Sure, yeah, so uh, I, I don't think that there's really a, I mean, it, Bitcoin mining is still a relatively um, opaque industry in terms of a lot of that data. There, there are some studies out there that put some estimates on it, but um, I, I think that part of the important thing to think about here is that um, Bitcoin isn't a static industry, right? Depending on where we invest our dollars, that hash rate is gonna shift around the globe. Um, in, you know, the choice is do we in invest in places where that can shift to areas uh, like the United States or Canada, where we can use higher percentages of renewables, or does that all remain in China? Does it remain, does it go to other areas that have cheap coal power? Um, I think that, you know, to date, a lot of that, uh, like most of the hash rate is still in China. Um, a lot of that during the wet season is going to be on hydro regions during the dry season on coal power. So um, I don't know how great our data is on, uh, on defining what percentage of renewables that coin mining uses today. But I think the important thing to think about is that no matter what we do on, like if, if we don't build hash rate here in the US, the incentive structure is there to where someone will build it someplace else. So um, it, it's important to think of that entire picture and not just sort of zero in on the static look of what it might be today or what it was a year ago. Right, so like if, uh, if we're not the ones that are using that energy, then someone else is going to be doing that, so might as well be us. Exactly, um, yeah. So, so yeah, so if you look like at the, at the amount, like the value of the amount of Bitcoin that's produced in the block reward, hash rate will increase until the point where it doesn't make to, it sense to invest in additional hash rate. So the question is, where does that new hash rate come from? Um, and, uh, and that's gonna, you know, it's gonna be, uh, it's a global competition, so, um, we, we have the choice to either participate in that or not. But regardless of whether we participate in the United States or in Canada or in Europe, somebody's going to be using that amount of, uh, of energy. 100%. Um, does anyone else want to touch I on just, misconceptions? I would just jump in there, Cass. Um, and I would just say, like, obviously everyone always talks about the energy consumption of Bitcoin mining, but I think it's actually interesting how we can 
it's just totally transparent, right? Like it's just, it's this network that you can, you understand how much it costs to run this network, how much energy it's using. And you can't really say that about many other networks out there, right? Like we have no idea how much the traditional financial banking system costs us. Sorry, my cat's coming up now. Um, and so I think that that's always really interesting. Um, in terms of how do we, I agree with Jesse, there's no way to understand like how much of the network is using um, renewable energies. There's a great, Chris Bendixson from CoinShares put out a great report with estimates. So he said about 77% of um, Bitcoin miners are using uh, renewable energies. So, I mean, as a miner, I think we just want to get our costs the cheapest that you can. And in the US, the cheapest cost is renewable energy. So that's good for us and the, and the world. Yeah, and uh, Chris's, and Chris's oh, coin shares are, to, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so, so to add on that point, so it, it's it's an interesting thing because people talk about you know the amount of energy that Bitcoin uses, and uh, in comparison to some things, yeah, it, it seems like a big number, but in terms of power markets, it's really not very big. So it's less than one tenth the size of just the energy consumption of Texas. So you know, in in terms of a global scale, it's still pretty small, and uh, and it's uh, yeah, I think it, it's more of a question of how do we use that bit of energy that uh, that secures the Bitcoin network? How do we provide that um, in, a, in a way that's efficient? Uh, and I think that, you know, the, in terms of the total amount of energy, when you're looking at comparing it to, um, you know, some small city somewhere, like I, I think uh, it sometimes forgets the scale of the total amount of energy used on the planet. Yeah, um, I, also to kind of elaborate on that point, in Chris's uh, CoinShares report, it basically shows that um, what you have is at a lot of these renewable sites, there's a lot of stranded energy. The transmission costs to transport that energy from the site of generation to a city um, or a town where that energy could be used is far too high to actually do that. So that energy just like sits there unused and stranded. So it actually makes a lot of sense for a lot of these uh, mining companies and operations to be popping up at the site of these uh, renewable generation sources um, just as a way to lower their costs and, and keep those uh, electricity rates down. So, um, yeah. did you have anything yeah, no, you I want? Think that's a, a, or, I think that's a really good point, Cassie. On the on the and it's uh, it, it's interesting that for Bitcoin mining, you don't require a lot of the same other resources that you need for, say, a traditional data center. So, traditional data center, you need a lot more fiber connectivity. You need a lot lower latency. You need a lot more staffing. So, you can't necessarily locate in every place that you could put a Bitcoin mine. And then, therefore, you can put these mines in places that have cheaper power than you uh, than you could for a traditional data center or other types of industry. Yeah, that's a good point, Jesse. Traditional data centers for the traditional like finance industry are located in New York and Chicago and all these hubs where you're in West Texas. And, and we've started to see this on the investment side is that Bitcoin miners or new Bitcoin miners are, are thinking about energy as just one of the variables in the business model and how do they sort of solve for the cost of that. And they're gonna make the choices that are gonna allow them to get the cheapest, best energy that they can. So I think this is something that's gonna be solved for just as the businesses mature, is that they're gonna to wanna to have the cheapest energy, they're gonna to wanna to use as little energy as possible because that's a big variable in their business model. So I think this is gonna solve for itself a bit as, uh, as firms mature. Yeah. I and so Fred, I would just add on that. Um, so we saw over the, you know, Bitcoin's been around for about 11 years now for the first like seven to eight years, we saw that hardware cost is the most important thing, right? And now location electricity cost is the most important competitive edge that you have moving forward as a Bitcoin miner. So I agree with you there. Yeah, I think if you look at the the history of ASIC development and you, you have to have these very rapid iteration cycles of a few months and now, you know, uh, S9s came out mid 2016 and people are still running S9s today because you have very low cost power, they're still profitable. Um, I think that that the the slowing of that iteration cycle is basically uh, two different factors. So one being that those ASICs are now catching up, they've caught up to the, the current processes that you use to, to uh, for manufacturing of other types of, uh, of hardware. And the other part being that just the iteration of the uh, the industry in general is getting slower in the um, uh, semiconductor manufacturing. Yeah, so um, moving on from, from this topic, all of you had really awesome thoughts there. Um, what, so what would you say is the largest threat to Bitcoin mining or like 
well, let's, let's back up a second. Would you, if we're gonna talk about the centralization of mining in China, um, this is a topic that was briefly mentioned earlier by Jesse, I believe. Um, do you think that this centralization poses an existential threat to Bitcoin? Um, and then also if you could elaborate on what exactly you're working on um, personally to uh, decentralize Bitcoin mining. Sure, yeah, so I, I do think that centralization of hash rate in, uh, in any country is an existential threat to Bitcoin. Um, I think that uh, sometimes it's a little bit e too easy to write it off as, you know, we'll just fork the algorithm or, or, uh, or change something. I, I don't think that if you play that out, that scenario, that it's actually um, a good scenario. If you, if you imagine that we all fork to a different algorithm and are, are all now using a different type of hardware, um, now you're back to the problem of, well, uh, whoever gets the first ASICs are going to control the hash rate and currently all that manufacturing is in China. So then you'll have a monopoly again pretty soon. And you know you could continue to fork that hash rate and then you can try to play like a Monero game where you have scheduled hard forks or something and you're trying to get everybody to mine on GPUs and <clears throat> then you're still vulnerable to large GPU players and you can just build a large GPU mine. So I don't think that's a scenario that we want to go down by any means. I think we need to, to definitely focus on decentralizing hash rate uh, in the first place to make that network stronger. Um, I think that uh, that Texas is going to be a, a play a big role in that. Um, I hope that, uh, that Canada Jesse, are you also plays a big role. Are you biased role. about Texas, though? You love Texas. I, I am. I am pretty biased about Texas. I'm. I'm Do you have your uh, cowboy boots on? A Texas native, I, but I. Uh, but I'm, I'm definitely a Texas convert. But it's it's a, a really unique energy market. It, it's a very business friendly place. Um, I think that it, it's definitely going to play a big role in the Bitcoin network in the future. But um, but the whole problem, I mean, you can't solve it all with just Texas or just uh, just one location. Uh, the, I think centralization in any place is uh, is detrimental for the for the network. I think that um, I'm a little bit disappointed in where uh, European hash rate has gone lately. But I think that uh, the U.S. and Canada still have quite a bit of potential. And then, uh, though, I think there'll be a couple of places in the world that might surprise us. I would say like one thing that I've been noticing over the past year of looking into the space is just how much um, U.S. involvement has been beginning to happen, both in terms of traditional data centers and also like the gas to crypto mining. There seems to be more companies popping up around that. So, I, you know, upstream data, Steve Barber was doing that a couple of years ago. And now we see a bunch of other companies like Russo, um, GAM, so Great American Mining and, and others popping up on the scene. Um, I think that what's really cool is to see all the different sites that are popping up in the US too of traditional data centers. So like layer one, um, there's, you know, the one that was on Green at Greenwich um, was on Coindesk the other day and Bloomberg, their site in North uh, New York. So yeah, I'm really excited to see um, all the different projects that are popping up in the US um, for making Bitcoin more decentralized. So, you know, a lot of what we try to do is understand the different players in the game and then also see like what they're doing. Um, and then our sites are also in North America. So that's that's good for the world in Bitcoin. I definitely want to come back to Brad on this question, but also um, for all three of you. Do you think that bringing hash rate to the United States, to North America, um, bringing hash rate out of China is enough to truly decentralize Bitcoin mining? Do you think that maybe we need like uh, the need for manufacturing facility outside of China um, is really the impetus that will kind of uh, kick into gear that that shift in, in hash rate uh, location? Yeah, so, so it's definitely difficult to get machines from China, right? So, I mean, I think right now we're at, it's like a six-month wait time for like the M30s that are new. Um, I would love to see a, a, a manufacturing facility in the U.S. because I think it would make things a lot easier for all the miners. Um, I just don't know when that will happen. I hope soon. But. Yeah, I, I think that um, I think that getting hash rate out is the first step. So I think building building the essential power infrastructure and data center infrastructure in uh, North America uh, is is really important. Um, I think the machines uh, at the current iteration pace and without continuing to slow down are less pressing. But I do think that ultimately that is an important piece of the equation. Although I think there there have been a lot of things that have been really helpful in that. So like Samsung becoming a manuf uh, a, mm -hmm. a a manufacturer now, or Samsung being a, a fab uh, option for um, for Bitcoin miners is a big deal. So uh, having some diversification there is is great, you know. Um, and then uh, in terms of the actual assembly of machines, um, 
you're starting to see a lot of the different manufacturers open up production lines outside of China, even just uh, in order to uh, to avoid tariffs. So I do think that you're going to start to see some decentralization there. I think part of the beautiful thing about Bitcoin and the algorithm that we have is that SHA-256 is simple. So it'll, it, the barrier to entry for new market entrants is a lot lower than for algorithms that would be more complex. So I, I do think that... Um, that there is potential for other manufacturers to open up, but that uh, that at, at the same time, it's become highly commoditized. So it's not necessarily an industry that, you know, if, if you look back like end of 2017, a lot of people were trying to get into the mining manufacturing space because profit margins were super high. Um, I don't think there's nearly as, demand, as much demand to do that now, uh, but I do think that strategically having some sort of uh, of Western manufacturing company uh, could be really, uh, really important. So yeah. Jesse, just to piggyback off of that, I think that that makes sense, but I, I really, I know Nabil wanted a debate, so here we are. Um, I, I really, um, I think that it, in traditional, like, like small startups, yes, it makes sense to be able to order machines from China and get them, you know, in the two week time frame that you have to pay the invoice. For large companies and institutions, that's actually not that easy. Um, so I'd love to see, you know, more sites pop up in the U.S. so that it's a little bit easier to, to bridge the gap between the institutional clients trying to buy these machines, preparing, paying a wire to China for two weeks and hoping that the machines get delivered in three to six months, right? Like, that's very unideal for, like, the world that I live in. So I think that you definitely have a competitive advantage um, when you can just, you know, work in the way that the, the mining hardware operations work right now. But if we want to see more institutional jump, institutions jumping in, we do need to change that and shift it a little bit. And I think getting US-based um, you know, people that are selling these machines would be better for us. I, so I, I definitely agree on the point that I think that, um, so institutional capital is going to be very important in the coming years in Bitcoin mining. In order to get significant amounts of hash rate out of China, you, you need a lot of capital, and that's basically got to come from institutions. So you, so you need to make Bitcoin mining institutionally friendly, um, and currently it is not. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the industry is still uh, in a very young stage. Uh, it's definitely getting better. So uh, you know, first time we ordered machines, it was just you send a check over to China, and you hope that they show up in a few months. Um, <laughs> The, it's gotten better than that now. So on, on large orders, a lot of the manufacturers now will have some sort of down payment and then you know payment at different steps and then like a final payment uh, before shipment. You know, that's that's, that's like still the, not ideal. That's not. Right? That, yeah. That's, that's still like, not. Yeah. Like, like they're, they're uh, although I, I think that because the industry has become so commoditized, which is I think part of the natural game theory in in that uh, manufacturer market, um, that those manufacturers are getting more competitive, both in terms of pricing and in terms of deal structure. Um, I think that uh, that's going to continue to happen. I think that manufacturers that don't get more competitive on that won't have access to American institutional capital, and then uh, they're going to have to either change or they're going to uh, they're going to uh, succumb to competition. So. Uh, I, I do think that that will get solved over time. I think that you know having some more yeah, more Western options could be helpful in that, but uh, but I do think that all the current manufacturers are making progress on that as well. Let's let's elaborate on that just a little bit. Um, this is directed at you, Brad. Uh, we've touched on like the need for capital in this space, um, and that's something that's really tricky, especially in an industry where there's so much risk involved. Um, what are you what are you working on to hedge that risk? What do uh, like what is appealing? What's appetizing to institutional, both endemic and non-endemic investors when they're looking at Bitcoin mining? How do you kind of manage that risk, um, and how do you ensure that there's capital flowing into the space? Well, I think it's been interesting to see just the overall growth of investment in the space, especially from institutions in the US. Um, you know, we've recently made our first investment in a mining company, and that was in Caruso, who's doing um, uh, flared natural gas as the energy source for, for mining in Texas, I believe. Um, but it, it's, to me, like the whole, as the more investment comes into the space, decentralization is obviously an important part of the Bitcoin ecosystem. And we've seen sort of the Bitcoin default to decentralization as often as it can. And I think that's gonna to happen too, as, as more investment comes in, there's an incentive to have mining, manufacturing of mining equipment be more decentralized. 
And as talent and money flows in, I think people are going to default to those options because they're, they're, they're starting to build businesses and they, you, have to build, you have to start with that foundation. That foundation needs to be decentralized to have longevity. So, so I think you think you're seeing it already as new mining firms come in, as new investment comes in, it is in options to solve some of the problems we're talking about. And I think that's encouraging and will continue to happen. What would you say, um, like look, the outlook for the next year or two, like what are some other ways that as the difficulty increases, as it becomes more difficult to solve for the block reward, um, what are some ways that miners can hedge against the risk? What do you, what do you think the, the future of, of that strategy looks like? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged that you see more and more people talking about the derivatives on, on difficulty. Um, you know, uh, GSR and Interhash uh, released something in December where they're working on it uh, with, uh, with the mining company. Uh, I think Jeremy Rubin released something about uh, POW swap. Uh, so, so people are starting to... Uh, NIO, Matt, Matt Rozak, I think, is working on something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so this, this seems to be moving pretty fast, where people are recognizing it's a problem, people are recognizing that um, you know, having the ability to, to, to hedge difficulty and to, to build a better, more robust business model is just is becoming important. So I'm glad that we're not the only ones working on this. I'm glad that other people are thinking about this, trying to solve for it, and hopefully we'll just be one of the many participants that are uh, you know, helping miners solve for these problems. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Okay, crickets. Um, so. <laughs> What also be curious to know, it, you know, each of you, what, what you're doing is, is so different from one another. Um, what are some of the struggles that you're facing on a day-to-day -day basis? What are some of the challenges that you're uh, confronting, whether it's when working with, with minors, with financial institutions, and, and trying to get them on board with, with what you're doing? Um, what, is, what does that look like? Uh, I would say for us, it's just sort of speed of development, where, um, you know, we're not singularly focused on, you know, building this financial market for um, you know, derivatives and futures for, for miners. Uh, so, like finding the right partners, getting the right buy in on both sides, having the right incentives on both sides to move forward faster. Um, you know, I, I think uh, for us, it's like, you know, finding the right people to own the project and finding the, the, right, finding the right partners to sort of uh, iterate on it fast enough to bring it to market in, in a time that's going to be useful, right? Because you don't want to see this. Everyone's talking about it, it's, it's in you know, continuous beta but no one can actually use it because uh, that is not solving for the problem. So uh, I think that's our biggest problem. Um, yeah, time to market, I feel like in this space too, uh, is just huge. Time is money in Bitcoin mining. And what, like when you like experience delays from manufacturing, like you're potentially losing, you know, upwards of 50 grand a day, um, in some cases, depending on, on the hardware and, and, you know, the size of your order. Uh, I am curious to know um, with uh, coronavirus, have you personally, have you, has anyone been experiencing manufacturing delays? I know that um, there were delays in the past regardless, but like specific to this outbreak and uh, production being uh, halted for the time being, is, has that been something that's been on your, on your radar? Cassie, I can jump in. Um, so we ordered some more machines in January and we actually got them at like the perfect time frame. So we got them mid January um, and then everything happened and you know, machine, manufacturers haven't been working. I think they just started again this week because I heard that my replacement parts from the broken machines that were shipped to us, we have a, a small amount of parts that need to be fixed, which is pretty common. Uh, they're finally getting shipped to us. So we have experienced like a small uh, issue with it, but not at scale. Um, I also think that, I don't know, I don't know how we did it, but the timing was like absolutely perfect. So I'm happy with that. Yeah, I've, I've definitely heard a lot of uh, a lot of delays, definitely from some of the, the mining manufacturers on um, on manufacturing and, and even just people having to work from home because of coronavirus. So I, I definitely think that it's had a, a large impact on supply chains and that I would expect um, some pretty serious supply shocks. Um, and Brad, this is kind of an iteration of that question directed to you. Um, Let's assume that this like kind of continues to play out in a situation in which we experience delays because they're not able to, uh, you know, have these machines be assembled, um, and then across the board we're facing continued delays down the road, especially as we're nearing the halving. How do you think that that might affect uh, miners' profitability? How do you think that that might affect operations? Do you think 
it could put potentially more people out of business than those who just can't compete with uh, maybe because their electricity costs are a little higher? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it, it sounds to me that the issue is sort of global from that respect, where it's not just one or two people that are gonna have delays. Now, it might affect um, you know, startups or early or stage firms that maybe don't have the size or the scale to sort of pivot and, and survive. Um, but you know, hopefully those guys have taken the, made the right choices in terms of longevity and having a long uh, sort of runway to, to build, because this is sort of an unforeseen risk um, that bigger firms might be able to weather better. Um, but at this point, I'm not too concerned about it yet. Uh, but of course, we don't know enough about how big this, ep this epidemic is going to be yet that's either. That's very fair, so. yeah. Um, I think Brad has a good point there on the, uh, on, on the difference between in some, some different outlooks on the mining space. So one being more of a long-term planning outlook. If, you're, you know, if, if your intention with the mining operation was you were gonna order machines, get them plugged in at a relatively high cost area and try to mine as much as possible before the halving, and that was your whole you know, uh, time horizon, your investment's probably not looking too good at this point. Uh, but if you're taking a longer term perspective saying, you know, you're gonna be in mining for five or 10 years, you're building you know, large, cheaper infrastructure, um, you have a longer procurement timeline and a sort of a longer ramp, um, then events like this are gonna affect you a lot less than some of those shorter term thinkers. So kind of with that in mind, um, this, is, this question is directed to everyone in their uh, particular areas of expertise. Uh, what does it look like then to build out infrastructure with long-term sustainability in mind? Um, obviously cheap power, but what else does that entail? Do you wanna start, Jesse? Uh, yeah. Sure, yeah, I mean, so it, it's a combination of a few things. So, uh, so you, you build some more capital intensive infrastructure in order to shift money away from ongoing uh, OPEX. Now those, uh, those investments in terms of uh, utilization rate, you, you're, you know, with Bitcoin, your utilization rate is super high. So you get a, a really quick payback in terms of any other sort of, um, of infrastructure. Um, but, uh, but for Bitcoin, it's still sort of a longer time frame. Uh, so I think investments like that make a lot of sense. And I think also there are some design choices that you can make in terms of your actual data center facility itself that can promote longevity, that might be a little bit more expensive up front, but that can make it to where your machines have fewer failures and last longer over time. And I think that that is becoming more important, especially with the replacement cycle of machines lengthening. Amanda? Yeah, I would agree with everything Jesse says on that one. Um, not really much else to add, he covered it all. <laughs> yeah. Um, Brad, I'm curious too, from like an institutional standpoint, um, an investment standpoint, do you find that uh, looking at like, it, it, I mean, thinking about even vertical integration on like operationally with the mining site um, and like putting up some more like upfront capital costs um, just so that like down the road, your, uh, your ROI is gonna be maybe a little bit longer, but at the same time, the uh, duration of your uh, operation is probably gonna last a little, a little bit longer. Is that something that investors are thinking about? Is that something that like they're willing to spend that time and money and like figuring it out and getting it right so that rather than just diving into it and, and getting things up and running? Yeah, I think especially from a venture or even like a private equity investment mindset, you're, you're looking seven to 10 years out. You're not necessarily looking to buy machines, plug them in and have them start printing Bitcoin. Um, so it's really about the business model. It's about the entrepreneur um, and it, it is longer term focused. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's really about, uh, the, you know, finding that the right investors too, where you sort of want to have the, uh, the symmetry of a firm and an investor that has the same mindset in terms of longevity and building the business the right way for that you know, five to seven year time horizon. So it's a lot about matched to like money to idea and money to entrepreneur. And I, I think you're starting to see people who have the same, uh, the, the, the same ideologies about Bitcoin, about investing in the space where you need to have the decentralization, you need to be focused on security, you need to be focused on potentially privacy. So finding that match is, is becoming easier as you see more institutions start to think about and invest in the space. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, f I feel like in the last couple of years, we've really seen a lot of uh, maturity and, and growth in this space. And we, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier from a financial perspective. Um, also curious to elaborate on that just a little bit. 
like, what do you think the next iteration of technology in this in Bitcoin mining space looks like? Um, is it obviously like the hardware is going to continue to evolve, but at the same time, like with Moore's law, there's only so much we can do on the chip manufacturing side. Um, where, what exactly do you think? Um, whoops, uh, that's my cell phone. Uh, what exactly do you think is going to be the the next iteration to kind of continue pushing us forward? Thanks, Brad. Uh, and I think if you look at the industry now, it's shifting more terms uh, in terms of scale and uh, and cost of power. So cost of power is a huge driver. Another driver is uh, is your opex. So having larger operations where you can spread those operational costs, that's a big uh, a big area. And I think another big area is going to be in terms of uh, of financing and capital. That um, getting creative on on that side is going to enable larger scale. It's going to enable. Um, uh, larger projects that can get those economies of scale. So I think that um, I think that that's going to be where you see most of that competition. And I do think that that's an area where um, where uh, America has a big advantage. Jesse, out of curiosity for the audience, um, what's your cost of power? Um, I I don't know if we are publicly uh, okay. Gotcha. That or not. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> Just kidding then. <laughs> So I would uh, I would agree with Jesse that I think the cost of energy is, is definitely the key driver moving forward. But what really is exciting me is, is these companies building financial like financial products that are appealing to institutional and accredited investors on top of Bitcoin mining, right? So like what Brad is doing, I think that's really cool. Um, we also see people trying to build funds like Galaxy Digital, right? They're trying to do um, mining funds. There's a bunch of other ones too um, that I'm blanking on right now. But I think those types of things and seeing more shift of uh, hash power to the US is really what keeps me excited about Bitcoin mining. I've talked to probably two people in the last two weeks who are putting together uh, private equity funds for specific for mining. Um, so yeah. there's definitely, I think, a, a lot of uh, excitement and, and uh, money that's going to be flowing into the space in the next year. Yeah, I think some Which of that like, is also like protecting your investments already. <clears throat> excuse me, where if you already have a lot of money in the space, you have a lot of investments, how important is it for you to help build that foundation of mining infrastructure to make sure that the ecosystem continues to grow and, uh, you know, has the security and the, and the, and the strength to, to be here for the next 11 years at least? 100%. I think, Amanda. Totally. If you're investing in Bitcoin, you should be investing in the underlying structure that is supporting it. Right, especially at an institutional level. Like if you're gonna be investing in Bitcoin and providing Bitcoin services to customers, you should probably be a part of securing the network. Mm -hmm. Totally agree, totally agree. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely an, an underlooked piece for, um, for a lot of investors in the space because it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit technical and it's a little bit more you know, to do with power. Um, and, uh, and it's also I think super it's, weird. Yeah, it's and it's and it's super weird, and it's also a very you know it's a very immature market still. So, um, I think the market needs to become institutional. Uh, it needs to it needs to be higher quality, and then I think that you need to have uh, more investors in it because uh, it, there there are a lot of really cool things that you can build you know with Bitcoin and on top of it, but none of that works without the underlying security of mining. Um. I'm gonna wrap things up here and then open the floor to questions. Um, kind of just wanted to uh, provide some background on like what it looks like to build out a mining operation and like what it looks like to work in this space. Um, I'd be curious to know from each of you what is like one of the most like stressful or like intense or like super hands-on experiences that you've had in Bitcoin mining. Um, just a time that you were like, wow, this is super rough. Like never thought I would be doing this, getting into this uh, line of work. Just to kind of end on a lighter note. Amanda, do you want to um, start I, with that one? Yeah, I can okay. start. Um, so I guess um, the first thing that comes to mind, and I've told the story before, is when we um, expanded in 2016, we put um, a small amount of miners in one of our offices. And I, um, myself and one other employee went down over the weekend, and we were like, we could totally do this in like one day. And we ended up staying for like three days because wiring is like, the least cool thing to do ever for machines, right? And you don't think about it, um, but it does take time. So the physical, like putting together something is is not that fun. Um, but when you see it mining Bitcoin, it's totally worth it at the in the end. So that's the hands-on experience that I never thought when I went to college that I would be doing. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, was... that that definitely have a lot of uh, a lot of stories in terms of setting up some of our earlier mines, and um, I've got to say they've gotten a lot a lot easier to set up today than they used to be. Um, you know, like some of the the first mines we did were uh, were GPU mines, and setting up GPU miners is a, a massive pain. You have so much troubleshooting, so many components. Um, moving from that to like S9s, where you had you know you're just plugging in a power supply and a couple cables and you know, some internet connection it's a lot easier and now you know the machines come and they've got the power supply just hardwired into it um with a with a bus bar and that you know that it's gotten a lot better but definitely had some uh some long long uh days or weeks um putting together mines in the past i don't know if that's more difficult um than it is to try to get some people's head wrapped around what we're trying to do internally and i'm sure brad can can so, probably attest to that portion of it. <laughs> uh, well, I, I've had that journey where, I mean, when I started in the space, it was on the trading side. So switching from tra a traditional trading desk to the, like, you know, the Bitcoin crypto trading desk, going from, you know, 8, 3 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon to 24, 7, and having to, uh, you know, dial back on other parts of my life, running a trading desk in Chicago 24, 7 uh, is, is, a, is a, a hard problem to solve for a lot of reasons. Um, but starting from that aspect, we're just trying to solve the trading problem. But then, uh, you know, it, it, through, the, through that process and, you know, two and a half plus years, learning about the space and actually learning about, um, you know, Bitcoin, the ecosystem, the security, mining, and, and now actually starting to think about solving problems for other people in the space uh, as an investor, but just as like an enthusiast as well. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's a much different uh, path than, uh, you know, than, than the, the, the miners have taken, but like sort of to, to be here and be able to start thinking about what problems people in the ecosystem face and how to maybe invest in the right areas or create products in the right areas to, to help not only us as a business grow, but the ecosystem grow as well, I think is, uh, is pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's um, huge for this space, like definitely a large signal that, you know, we have uh, financial products that are, that are being built around this and people that are like really excited to get into this space and, and help uh, provide those products and tools for for miners, so very exciting. I imagine that you were probably highly caffeinated and uh, staying up almost all hours of the night when you first started. I didn't drink, co I didn't, I didn't drink coffee before crypto. <laughs> oh, that's rough, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, fun story on that. I think all miners are kind of like that. When I met Jesse, it was at 5.30 in the morning and he was drinking Red Bull. <laughs> yeah, Jesse and I both have a, a, an auto subscribe on Amazon to Red Bull, so we get those, <laughs> those cases. Um, it's probably really healthy. Uh, so. <laughs> I don't know if you guys want to add anything, but um, I'd like to go ahead and open up the floor to questions if anyone has something that they'd like to ask. Hi, first of all, thank you for the great panel. Um, so you have all mentioned that you know mining, it's really a sort of global race to find the cheapest energy possible wherever you can. And because it's zero sum, it's pretty much like the only consideration you can really have. So I'm curious, do you, do you guys foresee a future with a greater penetration of renewables in the space or a greater penetration of fossil fuels? Especially considering like here in the US, we have a lot of hydro that we use for mining, but even now we've got a bit of a boom with natural gas. So if here we're seeing a growth in sort of fossil fuels, what can we expect from other countries? So I think, I think that overall you're gonna see a growth uh, in renewables. I think that uh, in general, what you see is a growth in stranded assets. So. Um, there are some places in, in the world, so some parts of uh, Southern Asia, where you see a higher growth of, um, of coal-based power, um, or, uh, you know, or, or uh, in China as well, uh, depending on, uh, on if you're looking at, you know, at the dry season in, in China. Um, I think that mostly in the West, you're seeing either renewable power or, uh, or flared natural gas. Um, and uh, in general, you see that occurring in areas where you have underutilized resources. Um, and that's, uh, that makes sense from an economic standpoint in that when resources are more utilized, when, the, uh, when, when those could potentially be used for more productive uses, they're gonna be more expensive because other people are gonna be willing to pay more for them. Bitcoin miners aren't willing to pay a whole lot for power. Uh, so they're really only gonna get stuff that other people don't want. Hey, so um, there's been a lot of uh, like research and kind of questioning surrounding the long-term viability of Bitcoin security. Um, do you guys think that Bitcoin's monetary policy, so 21 million issued over you know, um, 
every 10 minutes in, in blocks. Uh, do you think that's a, a benefit to Bitcoin's long-term security, or do you think it's something that will cause it problems in the future? So I think it's interesting. I think that uh, I think that it's something that the market sort of needed in order to coalesce around Bitcoin, where uh, it's it's a very clear, simple monetary policy of you know it's cap supply. Um, people sort of understand what they're getting into with it. I think the question is going to be in terms of what do you, what do transaction fees look like in the future, and how does how much mining does that support, um, and what does that mining look like distribution wise? So I think that the the important question to solve there is um, what's the distribution of that hash rate, regardless of what sort of level it's at, and then it has to be at some sort of significantly large level to where uh, it's not easy for some player to just come in and, and easily attack the whole network. Yeah, so actually off that um, and off Casey's point about long-term sustainability, um, you can, you know, if things go as planned, you can you can see a future where uh, large-scale mining facilities are a target for nation states, kind of like the Aramco attack in Saudi. Do the economic incentives um, make that concern irrelevant? Um, or is there some inherent political risk in all of this? Like, how do we protect the Citadel or does it protect itself in a way? Are you, are you talking in terms in terms of like uh, like nation states coming in and, and building their own mining operations, or uh, no, like direct attacks uh, against mining facilities um, in whatever shape that may take. Like, does that not make sense if Bitcoin becomes like the foundation for uh, the global financial infrastructure of the world? Or uh, are you talking about in terms of like uh, like nations? Uh, I guess banning mining in their own in their own uh, in their own country or uh, in, in like trying to attack mining operations Banning, direct attacks countries. making energy more expensive um anything along those lines yeah so so i think it's an interesting one because uh i do think that that some nations are going to try and do that um i now i, I don't know you know like china has been kind of back and forth on whether or not they they like bitcoin mining but i think part of the interesting thing about that is that uh, you have this worldwide competition so as long as, as there's enough you know, distribution of that hash rate, it doesn't really matter if any one or any couple of countries uh, attack Bitcoin mining in their own country because there's, there are other people that'll just get that reward instead. I think that the, uh, the economic incentives line up to where um, it's beneficial for people to have Bitcoin mining in their country. Um, I, I think that uh, there will be some places that embrace that more than others. So I think Texas is going to be one of those places, like it's an energy state, uh, energy production and consumption is the lifeblood of Texas. So I think that, you know, a couple percentage extra consumption in, in, in Texas, that's a flexible load that could be a potential benefit to the grid. Uh, I think that, you know, that's, we're, we're open arms here. Um, I, I hope that, you know, Canada continues to, to open its, uh, its Bitcoin or its, its arms to Bitcoin mining. It's been, you know, there's, there's been some restrictions and some kind of back and forth in the past, but um, I, I hope that that becomes a bigger sector. And I think that uh, that overall the incentives are aligned such that places will benefit from uh, from having that Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin mining where they are. Um, the I, I think uh, you know there there is a question of like public perception in, in different areas, but I think part of what's going to be helpful on that is uh, is the industry becoming more institutionalized. And uh, you know if you look historically, it's been uh, Pretty sketchy. A lot of the companies that that uh, that have, have been in this, it's you know, it's it's kind of a, a lot of it. Even it's just that it's it's overseas. It's this like, internet money thing, so people don't really have a really good understanding of it. So when you saw Bitcoin miners go into places like Washington or some of the places in Canada originally, um, a lot of you had local people who weren't as friendly with it. Um, I don't think that's a problem that you have in Texas. I think that you know everybody here likes uh, uh, everybody here understands energy and likes energy. I think that uh, with further education and with more institutions coming into the space, that's going to become less of an issue in other areas rather than more of one. But um, but I think that that overall the incentive structure is uh, is set up the right way to where um, countries will benefit from having more Bitcoin mining in their country. All right, I have a feature request, which is I'd like to co-locate miners in your facilities and. Uh, have opinionated block construction, like for example, um, segwit only blocks and things like that. And uh, the question is, do any of you support that? What do you what do you see as the roadmap for that? The only the main thing I'm familiar with is block streams facility and the the pending arrival of better hash. And so, um, 
we don't have a co-location facility, but if you wanted to chat with Blockstream, I can connect you with them. <laughs> I, I don't know, um, like I can't answer that question because we don't, we don't have anything to offer for that. Um, there's also the slush pool, um, slush pool stratum V2, right? That is coming out that will help you help give miners a little bit more incentive to, my, uh, to assemble their own block. So I think there's future things that will come that will be helpful to everyone. Um, but Jesse is really the person to ask if you want a co-location facility. So we're we're not currently offering co-location to the public, but I do think I do think I support you know anything that allows miners to create their own blocks. Um, I think is important. I think that uh, centralization of power in pools is also uh, an important issue. I think uh, you look at, at uh, I think it's near 70% of the pools right now are Chinese pools, and then there's about 20 or 25% that are just completely unknown. So I think uh, I think it's important to have that sort of optionality where the people who are actually doing mining ha that own that individual hash rate have some say in what gets put into blocks. Um, I, I think that uh, that that you know that could be potentially an important issue in the future, and I think that I, I support any any of the different uh, functions that are are working on that. I was wondering if uh, any of you could talk about the financial forecasting that you need to uh, worry about. Uh, it seems to be a, a basic dilemma of mining that, say, if you can mine a Bitcoin for seven thousand dollars and sell it for eight thousand dollars, that's a, a that's a pretty good thing. But you don't know what's going to be next month. Well, actually, in a few months, that $7,000 Bitcoin is going to cost $14,000. And if you're still getting $8,000 for it, then that's a really bad deal. So you must have some idea of what these are going to be worth in the future when you mine them, say, next summer or next winter. And you have to, you have to consider what's your return on capital. You know, mm. how's that compared to what you could have been doing with the capital otherwise? In the old days, you would have done better to just buy Bitcoin than to buy graphics cards. Uh, so what, what are your, basically, why are you doing this? What, what do you think is going to happen to your capital? So there's two main things with mining Bitcoin, right? It's hash rate and price of Bitcoin that really matter for your return. And you literally can't control either one of those things, right? But what you can control is your setup. So you can control how much you're paying for energy, how much you paid for machines, how much your pool cost is. All of those things can be baked into your model, along with you know, maintenance, replacement, um, employees, et cetera. So if you think about this as a long-term goal, right? If you can mine Bitcoin over time, um, and you can mine Bitcoin for a lower cost than you can buy it on the market, then that makes a lot of sense. And you could figure out exactly how much you're mining a Bitcoin for, like within your model. And obviously you have like sensitivity charts of like if hash rate goes up a ton or if price goes up a ton or vice versa. Um, you can't have like an exact like, hey, we're going to mine exactly this amount of Bitcoin and this is how much it's going to be worth. But you can have a rough estimate um, if you have the right setup. So that's why, again, it goes back to your, your cost of electricity and energy is the number one thing that matters right now. But your, yeah, your, so your, uh, good... your prediction of future prices has to matter. So you must have that modeled in. So you can have like a, an idea and you could do that historically based on the price of Bitcoin or you can keep it static, right? Because you don't know if it's going to go up or down. I think that's just, that's more of a, what is your appetite for sensitivity versus, you know, what's actually going to happen. So there is no, like you can't go in, I, I can't go into my, my stakeholders and say like, I'm going to make X amount of dollars. But I can tell them I'm going to mine about X amount of Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a longer term gain, I think, for from my perspective. So I, I think this is a really good question. And I think that um, that this has to do with a lot of the, the education around Bitcoin mining. And I think a lot of the, the articles that you see that come out today that are like, this company has this, you know, X dollars for Bitcoin production cost are really unhelpful in, in shaping this. So that's, that's not really how we think of uh, Bitcoin mining at all. Um, so Bitcoin mining, it's a competitive industry. You have a certain amount of Bitcoin that's given out with every block. And then the question is, who does that get distributed to? So whatever your percentage of hash rate is, is basically over the long run, how much Bitcoin that you get. Um, so what happens is when price of Bitcoin goes up, the incentive to mine also goes up. So people put new machines on the, on the network. When price of Bitcoin goes down or the halvening or whatever, whatever event happens where profitability goes down, high cost producers turn off their machines. And you saw this happen in 2018. You saw um, about a third of the hash rate come offline. Uh, you, you'll see this 
uh, happen in times when profitability gets lower, those higher cost producers turn off. And naturally, when uh, profitability is higher, people build out wherever they can. They try to build out quickly because that incentive is so high. So a lot of those people build out at higher cost regions. So what you end up getting is basically this insulation for low cost producers. But if you're a, you know, a, if you're a marginal cost producer, even small fluctuations in the price of Bitcoin can completely wash away your profitability. So you know, if you only have a 10% margin, a 10% change in price of Bitcoin can completely wipe out all of your, uh, all your profit. But if you've got an 80 or a 90% margin, then a 10% change in the price of Bitcoin doesn't affect you as much. And as that continues to go down, those other players drop out and your profitability, uh, essentially, uh, there's some pressure alleviated on that. So in the long run, what matters, so obviously price of Bitcoin matters because it sets who are the players that are playing in that. Uh, but in the long run, what matters most is the relative cost of production of your mining operation to somebody else's mining operation. So it's a different sort of risk profile of investment than just investing in Bitcoin. Um, you know, it, it, uh, I think all of us believe in Bitcoin in the long term. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be in this industry in the first place. But I don't think that a belief in Bitcoin is necessary in order to have a successful mining operation. If you believe that Bitcoin is going to be around in any sort of capacity in the future, if you can have a lower cost operation than other players, you can still make money on just the difference in cost of operation of your operation versus another. Um, so you know, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, I'm personally not smart enough to, to predict what price of Bitcoin is going to be in the future. If, uh, if I knew that, I don't think there'd be any reason to set up a mining operation. You could just you know, lever up and, uh, and make your bets on Bitcoin. But, um, but I, think that, uh, I think that Bitcoin mining makes a lot of sense from looking at it as sort of, uh, and sort of a competitive commodity uh, production. So it's you know sort of similar in that way to something like the oil business, where you want to be the lowest cost producer um, in times of low profitability. Those higher cost producers shut off. Uh, so you're you know really over the long term, you're you, all you can control is your cost, and uh, the market where the market goes will affect your profitability. But uh, when Bitcoin price goes up, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't pull you up as much as you might think. And when it goes down, it doesn't shut you down as much as you might think as well. Yeah. And I would just add that if price is that much of a variable in your model, there are financial institute, financial instruments now to hedge that, whether it's options or futures on the price of Bitcoin, that if you know that the price falls below $6,000, that you, know, you need to shut off some mines, you can buy a $6,000 put so that you're making money on the put while you're losing money on your mining. And there are, there are ways to use financial instruments to start to hedge some of that risk on regulated exchanges and not just the ones that Jesse's gonna lever up on. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that the financial instruments are definitely going to, be, uh, going to be helpful in the future in mining operations, sort of um, hedging out their profitability. I think that I don't, I don't uh, in terms of current that. timelines, the uh, the, the cost of those is still pretty high. So it's, it's difficult to buy out on too far of a timeline to actually really like build a mining operation based on, based on that. And you know, if you have an existing miner operation, you could, uh, you could hedge some production over the future. But um, I, think that, uh, I think that still there's, uh, there's so much volatility in price that it's difficult to price out an option far enough to, to actually finance a mining operation. I'm, so, I'm sorry for what happened, guys. Okay. Yeah, that was actually kind of my question. So are miners currently using these derivative <laughs> contracts? Like, I'm guessing HODL farms probably just HODLs, but, like, are there conversations uh, among different miners in America about, you know, are they offloading it to traders to try to get a yield, or are they trying to stay price neutral? Uh, so we do work with a few miners to develop these product, these financial products to, he to allow them to hedge some of their risk. Um, are they using them in, in a very, like, uh, as, as part of a big part of the business. I, I don't think that I know if anyone is doing it yet, but everyone is still sort of in the research phase, as like Amanda said earlier, is um, we can't offer these out to every miner because we're still learning how to price them and how to manage our risk and our capital to like, offer these products. And we're still looking for more feedback from miners to, uh, to build a better product. So I think a lot of these are still in their infancy. But as we sort of hopefully iterate through these over the next weeks or months, hopefully they become uh, easier to trade, uh, more prominent, so that they so that more miners will be using them. 
Uh, but it's standing up a market like this is you need both sides and trying to find both sides is a little difficult. All right. Wrap it up. Yeah, Thanks, everyone. Good. We appreciate it. Uh, loved all the questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse and Amanda, for joining us remotely. Uh, I was Thanks expecting you to know. see your dog, Amanda. I, I was promised. Oh, wait. Wait, I'll show you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> all right. Let's give one more round of, uh, of applause for Cassie, Brad, Jesse, and, and Amanda.